Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Politics Show. Today, I'm joined with Maria Mendez. Uh, how are you? Good, good. How are you, Paul? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, would you be able to provide for myself and the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes. Um, so I'm a graduate student at the University of Minnesota. I'm in the political science department, um, and I'm, I'm also a junior fellow at uh, the Harvard Society of Fellows. And, uh, and so my dissertation, um, the one I'm working on and trying to wrap up by the end of the summer, um, looks at transnational gang violence in Central America. Um, and so I try to think of, uh, of gang violence as not only a destructive force in the re re region, which it is, um, but also as a, as a force that produces livelihoods and identities for the people who engage in it. So uh, the United States in recent history, perhaps to my unknowing knowledge, longer history, has a record of dehumanizing gangs, something that I hope we're going to talk about as this conversation continues. However, for those wondering in the audience, why would someone go about joining a gang? Sure. So maybe let me give you a little bit of background um, in terms of the gangs that I'm looking at. So in my research, I look at, at two gangs. Um, so MS-13, which you might have heard of, um, because it's precisely one of those gangs that has been uh, reduced to, to animalistic tropes. And there's also Barrio 18, and here in the U.S. it's known as the 18th Street Gang. So these are two gangs that I that I study, and they are present across Central America, but also in the United States, in Canada, and you will find chapters that pledge allegiance to these gangs in Europe, um, in South America, uh, but most of them are located in Central America. And um, so why would someone join a gang, right? And, and this is a question um, that has been asked, um, has been asked since the 1900s. You have the Chicago School, right, with uh, um, this famous studies about gangs. And I think um, back then, like now, <laughs> um, I think many of the reasons uh, why people join gangs haven't changed that much. Um, and, and I would say, of course, you know, the motives and the reasons are many. People are complex, right? So if you ask someone, uh, you know, why do you go to school? They'll tell you something today and you know, something very different in, 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 in a year, perhaps. Um, so I don't want to say that these are the only reasons why people would join gangs, but at least in my research and also I think literature on gangs, they'll tell you that, you know, people join uh, because they live in extremely impoverished um, impoverished communities um, where a sense of identity is not fulfilled by schools, uh, is not fulfilled um, by your condition of citizenship um, or non-citizenship, right? Um, uh, gangs, I mean, mostly arise in impoverished communities in the U.S. across the world, right? That's, that's um, uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty established. Um, and so many, many really join gangs uh, because for the same reason that you would join a group of friends. So the sense of company, the sense of, uh, you know, many gangs will talk about family, right? Uh, being part of a family. I mean, let's remember, at least in Central America, many of the people who, uh, who are joining gangs um, are people who have suffered child abuse, um, have been um, abandoned by parents, right? And I mean, none of this is, 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 is just typical in Central America, uh, but are coming from, um, you know, very difficult family backgrounds and also socioeconomic ones, right? Um, and joining a gang, it provides you a sense that you're a part of something, right? That there is, that there is, uh, there, there's meaning to your life. There's a sense of importance that is fulfilled by being part of this group that you perhaps don't find elsewhere, um, that you don't find in schools and churches, right? In other, in other communities. Um, and so I think, I, I think that's one of the main reasons, right? So for this sense uh, of identification of belonging and membership, um, and then there's many others, but I think that that one is, is, is pretty prevalent, uh, prevalent, excuse me, across uh, communities um, in the world. So just to kind of impose, uh, would bad economic policy also, just in, in a more general sense, be a reason for this rise in, in violence because people need to resort to that? So maybe let's let's distinguish between right sort of gang membership and gang violence mm -hmm. so when 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 people 
join gangs, um, they don't really join to injure others, right? They don't join because, you know, they want to kill people. Um, uh, many, as I said, right, many of the reasons why they join are similar to why people look for spaces uh, where they can be, where they can find self-validation, right? A sense of respect or recognition. Um, now, of course, the communities that um, that I look at and also where, where gangs uh, proliferate uh, tend to be extremely impoverished communities. So it, in, in the case of the United States, right, if we think about the economic landscape, um, we're thinking about um, gangs overlapping uh, with criminal economies, um, especially in, in the era of deindustrialization. So when, uh, you know, jobs are becoming more scarce, right, um, uh, then, you know, you have people who have to make a living, right? And, and gangs, in addition to that sense of belonging, uh, once they become engaged in these criminal economies, which I want to clarify that not all gangs, you know, engage in, in illicit economies, um, but it provides a source of employment, right? A, 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 it's a source of, uh, allows you to make a living. Um, so that's kind of the economic landscape in the U.S. and Central America, um, you know, similarly, right? So you have, um, after the civil wars in, 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 the, in the 70s and in the 80s, and especially as a result of many uh, neoliberal policies that um, displace people from the countryside, you have an influx of people, uh, so a lot of people migrating to the cities. Um, and then you find yourself in the cities with no jobs, right, living in slums. Um, and so engagement in the gang, in addition to that sense of belonging, is also is, is a source of employment. Um, and I think uh, that's definitely something we miss. And violence, like the exercise of violence, um, becomes a form of work, right? Um, and that's uh, that's uh, something that in my in my dissertation I, I, I argue that uh, that gang violence is uh, constitutes work. It's a form of work. And if we think of it as work, then we see many other dimensions that we uh, usually lose when we adhere to to these. Uh, stigmatizing discourses about them. So I know a lot of people wonder how gangs have garnered this more power in a way than government itself. You know, so how do gangs get that legitimacy that would constitute them more legitimate than government itself? Sure. Um, yeah, so first, not all gangs, I think, have have uh, gained a sense of legitimacy in the communities that they that they operate. Uh, but I think you're right to point out um, that that some have accrued this this moral social legitimacy in their communities. And I think it's important to bring attention to that, right? Because oftentimes we just think of them um, as um, as interrupting social and political order and not as instituting social and political order, right, which, which requires some level of legitimacy. If you're going to sustain an order, um, it can't it can just be through violence. Um, although I, I must say that yeah, violence is uh, uh, for sure one of the strategies through which this order is sustained. Um, but let me give you an example, for instance, in Central America, right? Um, MS-13, especially in, in, the, in, the past, uh, in the past decade, past few years, um, has been moving away from one of the economies that um, has uh, been at the center uh, of gang activity and, and it's extortion, right? So extortion is pretty much just, you know, I think here in the U.S. not everyone actually knows what that looks like um, because probably you haven't been extorted. Um, many people in Central America have been and, 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 and are migrating to the United States because of that. But that means that you know, if you have a little shop um, in, in a marginalized neighborhood in, in, in Honduras, for instance, right, um, and the gang comes and tells you, you know, you need to start paying me um, 100 lempiras, like $5 um, every week, and I'm going to come and pick that up, right? And if you, do the, if you don't do this, will kill you, right? Or, or will do something to you, will damage your property. And so, of course, right, there's the threat and, uh, you know, no violence, physical violence has been used yet, uh, but the threat ensures them that you pay them that money. Um, and, um, and so these extortion, um, these, these, these protection rackets um, have been sort of the bread and butter um, of gangs, this, especially since, since they were massively imprisoned in the, in, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, they needed a source of income, 
right? A lot of people were being put in the prisons and, uh, you know, they couldn't work from the prisons, right? Um, and so extortion became this important economy through which they were able to sustain in prison leaders and their families, um, because we have to remember that, you know, gangs are networks. It's not just your inner core and your gangster in this uh, Im image, right, of, of, of the gangster being, uh, uh, being the gang, uh, we're thinking about networks, right? girlfriends, mothers, grandmothers, children uh, being involved in these economies. Um, and so as they've been moving away from these economies, sorry, extorting um, the community in which they're embedded, um, then uh, they've, been, they've been able to, to gain some legitimacy because they've been investing, for instance, in, in, in uh, everything from paving roads, <laughs> Uh, from celebrating children's uh, birthdays, from providing lunches to schools. So doing a lot of the functions that we associate with the state, um, I believe that that's, that's definitely one of the ways to which they've been able to gain some kind of legitimacy in those communities, right? So where they're, they're no longer just seen as enemies, not just as predators and people who are stealing from the community, um, but that are actually investing in it. I mean, in the same way, right, that we, if we think of drug traffickers uh, and just bigger organizations doing that across the world, um, that's that's one of the ways. So they've almost, in some way, taken upon this policy of this of some of the responsibilities of the state. Uh, despite that, however, you know, there's a, a barrage of U.S. politicians and U.S. policymakers who call gangs and members of gangs barbaric and associate them in terms of criminality. Uh, However, you say things like this should not be done. Uh, can you explain? Sure, and, and just to give a bit of uh, background on, on these uh, tropes that are used to characterize gangs. So if you remember in May uh, of 2018, the White House released uh, a memo and was entitled uh, What You Need to Know About uh, the MS-13 Animals or, or, or something along those lines, right? Um, and then it went on to repeat uh, the, the label animals another 10 times to describe them right? and, to, and, and to make sure that you had internalized this idea that MS-13 is destroying peaceful neighborhoods in the United States and you felt uh, the fear. Um, and the, these discourses have been used um, in, in a political uh, conjuncture <laughs> where anti-immigration um, has been has been an anti-immigration anti agenda has been central to to the current government, right? Um, and in some ways, um, so one way of looking at it, right, is that these are, um, in some ways, discourses that are used to to prop up uh, an anti-immigration agenda to make people really scared of these individuals, right? So we talk about how brutal they are; they're raping everyone. You know, look at how violent. Uh, look at their faces, right? So we see images of them, their tattoos. Um, although actually most uh, gang members in Central America don't tattoo themselves anymore. Uh, but we have, right, these iconic images of gangs that inspire fear. Um, and of course, then the, the, the discourse that accompanies that is, um, is about constructing a wall, right? We need to keep them away, right? We can't let those barbaric animals come in, 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 into this country. Um, so, so it's a dual discourse, right? It's one that uh, also is accompanied by, by an anti-immigration one. And uh, these tropes of, um, that reduce uh, humans to animals, the, this is an old historical trope, right? Not only used by the United States, uh, but uh, just to give you two examples. So for instance, when um, a drone operation is considered successful, um, the CIA calls it a bug splat. Right? Um, in Guantanamo, when, when, when people were detained, um, you have like Mohammed Al-Qahtani's testimony saying that he was forced to bark like a dog. They would put a leash on him as a, like he was a dog because it was during torture sessions, right? So you have a long history of um, not only using discourses, but actually making people embody animals. So why is that? Like why would anyone characterize right, someone as an animal? Other than oh, it's an insult, but there's something uh, there's something deeper, and and the fact is that the animal, right? Animals are the figure of that killable other. So that other who can be killed, 
and who uh, and whose killing does not unleash an ethical uproar, an ethical crisis, right? Um, so if you kill a human versus killing an animal, I mean, no matter if you're vegetarian, right, and, um, and in favor of animal rights, uh, we still don't see that as the same thing, right? Um, so in some ways, killing an animal is more acceptable, right? Unleashing violence against an animal is more acceptable. And so that's the way that I understand this discourse that uh, by dehumanizing um, certain individuals, right, then you, in some ways, you legitimize um, policies, right, everything from incarceration, everything from hard um, iron fist policies, so persecution, extrajudicial killings, right, against this animal other. Um, so that's the function of that discourse, as I understand it. And it, you know, it, it has applied to gangs. I mean, mostly since since their inception in Central America, uh, but they're also applied to other racialized others, right? Can you potentially explain the effects of it on the individual who is being dehumanized? Uh, we we looking we're looking at it from the perspective of well, because what happens in the CIA and in, in Guantanamo. That, that's horrible, that's heinous, that's disgusting, and, and things like that, that dehumanization and referring to them as animals. But what does it do to the human psyche uh, in terms of characterizing an entire group of people as the other? That's, um, that's a great question, and, and, and I'm not sure I can answer it uh, uh, in the sense that um, I haven't been at the receiving end, right, of mm -hmm. that kind of violence and of, and, and of those discourses. Um, but but what I can tell you and um, is that gangs in Central America, uh, in particular, um, they uh, they not only have been so so this discourse of animality is not one that have just has just been taken up by the U.S. government, right? So governments in Latin in, in Central America, people, citizens in Central America also use it, uh, right? And it's and it's to draw a line. Right? Is, is you, know, you and us, um, right? Us, the respectable citizens and moral legislators, and you, um, you know, the, these killable um, animal others. And um, there's a lot of, um, for, for a lot of people joining gangs, as I told you, right, the sense of belonging, but it's also a sense um, of, of catharsis, if you wish. So, for instance, when you have been. <laughs> living in these impoverished communities. You've been at the receiving end of police violence because for many people, like in the United States, right, living in impoverished communities, the police doesn't, is, is, not, is, is not an entity that protects you, uh, but that victimizes you, right? So if you've been at the receiving end of police violence, of family abuse, right, um, of also economic marginalization, right, schools that you know, don't have the resources to, to, to allow you to feel empowered in any way, um, you 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 are responding to it and, and also you know that you're stigmatized that by living in these communities you're stigmatized right not only as poor um but also as animals right so uh, through these discourses um i think that feeds a lot that it it it, um, it it produces this sense that you're inferior right if if, if you want to think about the psyche um and and so what do you do with it, right? So you either just <laughs> keep feeling that way um, because you have all of these sources uh, of violence that are putting you down, that are stepping down on you. Um, you know, and suddenly you have this group that tells you that you can feel powerful, that this is an avenue for you to feel powerful, to revert, almost to revert, right, that sense of inferiority into one of superiority. And I'm not defending it, right? I mean, it's a very violent one, and it ends up victimizing marginalized people, which is which is the horrible consequence. Um, but but I think that what it leads to uh, really is that you know people find themselves uh, needing then an, a, another you know other discourses that make them feel human, um, that make them feel like uh, like they can find other futures, and then the, you know the gang has those discourses. Um, um, so, so in, in some ways, I think what, uh, what, what perhaps ends up happening is, is, is contradictory. So, I mean, these discourses end up actually, um, in some ways, feeding more children, more youth into gangs, um, if, if, if what they wanted was actually to end gangs uh, or end the violence associated with them.
So I know as part of your graduate work, you conducted the interviews with three different types of people, uh, members of gangs, those who lived in gang controlled territories, and those who fled. Uh, particularly, I'm, I'm very interested in those who lived in those territories and those who decided to flee. Do you have any insight on particularly though, uh, why they decide to flee or what life is like in gang controlled territories? Yes. Um, so I spent some time at a migrant shelter in Mexico and, and this is mostly where I encountered a lot of uh, Central Americans fleeing, um, uh, fleeing gang controlled territories, right? And this, so mostly people coming from Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. And um, not everyone, it, this I must clarify, right, because I think that there has been a lot of attention has been paid to people uh, leaving, fleeing the region because of gang violence. People keep leaving because of economic reasons, right? Um, uh, they, they, they're, they're leaving today because also, you know, climate change has brought these severe droughts in the region. People are also fleeing from, it's a more silent violence if you wish, but it's still, um, you know, it's still a violent context in that sense. Um, but for the people who were leaving gang controlled territory, so many of them, um, Many of them, I would say, most of the ones I spoke to um, were fleeing because they had refused to pay extortions. So people who owned small businesses, um, so corner shops, right, who either couldn't pay anymore uh, because the gang sometimes was asking them for you know, more than half um, of what they were earning every month. They just couldn't keep going. Um, there were, in fact, I mean, some of them would say, we were working for the gang. <laughs> Uh, because most of the profit was just being uh, being given to them. Um, other people from threats. Um, so there's the issue of um, forceful recruitment, right? Um, so that's a reality. I don't think it's um, at least none of the um, gang members that I interviewed were forcefully recruited. They joined uh, voluntarily, although I mean, to say that they joined voluntarily, you know, is is also um, is uh, is not to say that the context in which they were in also is encouraged them to join. Uh, it's not just a choice, um, but 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 there are um, there have been cases of people being forcefully recruited. So then, you know, women families leaving with their children because they don't want them to be recruited by the gang in the schools. Um, also threats. Um, a lot of women um, have been leaving Central America in the past um, five, six years. There's a very good um, document published by the UN. It's called Women on the Run. Um, and this is a new reality. So it used to be the case before in the past, it was mostly men leaving, right? So again, economic reasons. Um, and, but more recently, you, you, uh, there's a lot of women leaving the region. Um, and one of the one of the reasons has to do with um, um, forceful recruitment, um, you know, becoming girlfriends of gang members, right? Um, so, so threats or or the threat that I will rape your daughter if you don't give me money. Um, so, those those are more or less the people that I spoke to. Um, so, when they were leaving, it was it was mostly because they just couldn't they couldn't sustain the burden, the economic burden of paying gangs. What, so I, I also kind of want to touch on those who are actually don't flee the region uh, and those who live in the gang controlled areas. Sure. What is life like there? Because if you listen to U.S. media, if you listen to U.S. politicians, life almost seems, to lack of better terms, hellish. Um, and scary mm. and brutal. Uh, is that necessarily the case? I think that's definitely the case for some, uh, but it's not the case for everyone. And so maybe I can tell you a little bit about um, the, the exceptions, if you wish, or I, I don't think we can generalize, right? And, and especially because gangs, uh, they're not homogeneous. <laughs> Right, so gang chapters sometimes they're more repressive. People don't like them in the communities. Others um, are um, have the moral legitimacy that we were talking about, right? That social legitimacy. Um, and so, for instance, um, I've spoken to people um, who lived in MS control, uh, MS13 controlled neighborhoods in in, uh, in in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, 
and and for them uh, being inside their neighborhood they felt safe and they felt safe because they believed that ms-13 was protecting that territory right because especially as, as, as i was telling you right so um, some gangs have moved away from extorting their own communities um, and so they felt you know that you could walk in those neighborhoods and um, and just feel safe because MS-13 had, like the state um, in a way, um, had controlled criminality. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is confusing because it's criminals controlling criminals, right? So what is this, <laughs> what is happening? Um, but petty, petty robbery, um, you, you don't see that in some neighborhoods because MS-13 makes sure that in, you know, in their, what they call their territories, uh, this is not gonna happen. So of course, right, then people, you know, people might feel safe. Um, also what happens, and I think something that we forget um, and, uh, and that I was making, mentioning was that these are gangs that are also, they're socially embedded, right? So many of them are the sons and daughters of people who live in those communities. Uh, many of them, um, many community members saw them grow up since they were little children, right? Um, so the ties, so their kinship, their community ties with these groups. Um, and I think that sometimes what we, we don't see when we focus um, only on the sort of hellish, um, you know, uh, consequences of living under gang control, although I don't want to minimize those, right? Uh, I mean, we are, there are communities where people are in constant fear, um, in constant fear of the gangs that are controlling, right? There's a... Uh, is a motto, if it, 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 and it's uh, see, hear, and be silent. And sometimes you will find that written on um, on walls um, in in gang controlled ter uh, territories. And it's uh, you know gangs warning you basically of the consequences of you know saying anything about them. So you can't tell the police where they are. Um, you can't um, you you know if you're being extorted, you can't report that to the police either. Um, so I think. If we need to keep both both together, right? Neither dismiss one or minimize it, but also understand um, that these are complex structures and that they relate to people, right? That they're not outside forces just invading, right? I mean, these are people who are very much embedded in communities many times. So I, I want to tie this back into the realm of international relations IR. Uh, for many years, the United States has sort of treated that region of the world uh, as if it's backyard, as if it belongs to them, they can, as if they they feel empowered by it, whether it would be the Monroe Doctrine, wh wh whatever it may be, that they have the authority to do whatever it is in that in that region of the world. Um, do you believe U.S.-led policy in this region encourages the rise of gangs? It definitely it definitely led to it in the past. Um, so and in a very direct way, actually. Um, so in, from the 1960s to, to the end of the 1980s, you had civil wars in Central America, um, in Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador. And this is, this is the context of the Cold War, right? Um, and counterinsurgency wars being, being fought in Central America. Um, so the United States, supporting governments, I mean, really dictatorships, right, um, to fight against guerrilla movements, um, to fight against the peasants, community organizations. So anyone that they associated with communism, right, um, the, the, the goal was to put that down, just to shut these alternative voices of social justice, of uh, equal distribution of goods. The, the goal was to shut it down. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, they were very successful um, at uh, breaking down uh, that resistance. Um, and I say unfortunately, right, because many of the people who were involved, they weren't necessarily involved in the armed uh, movement. Um, so we had massive violence, right, in El Salvador, I mean, genocide in Guatemala. Um, and this led to, to migration. Um, right, so starting in the 70s, a lot of Central Americans start migrating to the United States. You have Salvadorans, Hondurans, Guatemalans, um, especially Salvadorans, right, then uh, fleeing and settling in, in LA, um, in California. And, and so a lot of them were 
very young when they left the region, my children. Um, and so they end up in these, in these poor neighborhoods um, that where gangs have already proliferated, right? Um, so where you already have the 18th Street gang. So that's not, that's not a Central American invention, right? MS-13 was born in LA, uh, right? As, a, as a, in, in, the, in the 1970s. Um, and so a lot of these, these youth um, who had parents who were working 12 hours per day, didn't speak English, um, you know, felt uh, very much uh, bullied, bullied at schools by other, by other students, um, they start coming together. And some of them join, a, a join Barrio 18, the 18th Street Bank, and others form MS-13. And what happens? So come the 90s, um, and you have the Rodney King riots, uh, legislation in the United States uh, starts uh, criminalizing um, a, lot of, a lot of these gangs. They end up in prison, and once in prison, many of them are deported because they're not citizens, right? They didn't have residence, even though they had spent most of their lives in the U.S. I mean, we're, we're seeing that right now, uh, not with gangs necessarily. Um, these people get deported. So between 1998 and 2005, more or less, you have 46,000 or more uh, convicts so, uh, of Central American origin, right, who are sent, who are sent to Central America. And when they're there, um, you know, they don't just shed their, their gang identities. Um, many of them start uh, local chapters. They start absorbing um, some of the, the gangs that already existed in the region, but which were not, you know, were not involved in illicit economies in the same way that they were in LA. Um, so you, what you have in fact, right, is, 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 is it's, a, it's an export. I mean, gangs is an export and a product of, um, of a counter, I mean, of U.S. foreign policy in, in Central America. So that's a direct connection that we can, we can point to. Um, and I don't want to say that, you know, it's just U.S. foreign policy, right? And there's many other aspects, but that's a determining factor um, in the formation of, of, of MS-13 and Barrio 18 in Central America. All right. Well, I, that's kind of where I want to end today's interview. I thank you greatly for joining me. Thanks for inviting me, Paul.